باسمكم جميعا نرحب بالسادة المتحدثين في جلستنا التالية والتي يديرها سعادة الدكتور راشد سيف المحرزي أستاذ مشارك في القياس والإحصاء كلية التربية جامعة السلطان قابوس يرحب بكم في الجلسة الخاصة بقياس المهارات وفي البداية أرحب بهذا الحضور الكبير في الحقيقة لهذا المؤتمر الخاص بتقويم التعليم ويسعدني ويشرفني أن أترأس هذه الجلسة وإن شاء الله تعالى سيكون لدينا أربع متحدثين خلال مدة ساعة وربع سيكون تنسيق الجلسة لمدة عشر إلى ربع ساعة عشر دقائق إلى ربع ساعة لكل متحدث بحيث نفتح إن شاء الله تعالى المجال للأسئلة والمقترحات الخاصة بكم ولاحقا إن شاء الله تعالى بالنسبة للأسئلة راح نفتح المجال للأسئلة في البداية نجمعها ثم نفتح المجال للمتحدثين للإجابة عن الأسئلة المتعلقة بهم في هذه الجلسة سيكون لدينا أربع أوراق من أربع متحدثين من مختلف دول العالم وسيكون لدينا الورقة الأولى مع البروفيسور جوردن جوجين وهو أستاذ فخري في مركز أبحاث التقييم والتعلم الرقمي بجامعة ديكن الأسترالية وقد سبق له أن ترأس معهد التدريس والتطوير التربوي في جامعة كوينز لاند بأستراليا بالإضافة إلى عمله مع مؤسسات التعليم ما بعد الثانوي في أستراليا وهونغ كونغ والمملكة المتحدة والشرق الأوسط وللبروفيسور مؤلفات عديدة في مجال التقييم في التعليم العالي مثل كتاب Assessment Learning and Judgment in Higher Education الذي نشرته دار سبرينجر لنشر للنشر عام 2009 وينصب اهتمامه حول التقييم للتعلم من خلال الكلمة المنطوقة وسيكون لدينا في ورقته المعنونة بطرق قياس مهارات القرن الحادي والعشرين في الجامعات الأسترالية فليتفضل so please, Dr. Jordan, you can start. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for coming and thank you for that introduction. Am I sounding okay? Do you, is it you hearing me all right? I'm hearing me twice. Let's see how we go. Ten minutes. Ten minutes to introduce you to 21st century skills in Australian universities. I'm talking about a very particular context of university uh, the skills um, that apply in universities in a particular context of Australia where we have 40 universities, 37 of them are directly funded and organised through the national government. They are relatively autonomous, the government doesn't have a high level of control over them, though it does exercise a degree of control through funding mechanisms and more recently through legislation. I'm going to try and do this very, fairly quickly. It'll be a very quick run through, and we're not moving. I'm flashing through the history of 21st century learning outcomes since 1992. In 1992, the Australian government published a report that was promoting what were, became known as graduate attributes uh, and more recently graduate learning outcomes. So in 1992 it was proposed that university graduates, wherever they came from and whatever course they did, should all have a number of common qualities, attributes, skills, um, regardless of, of the course or university they attended. These became known as graduate attributes. Much more recently they became known as graduate learning outcomes. Every university has a set of these learning outcomes. 
The move towards them has been supported through a number of government-sponsored projects over the last 26 years, culminating in 2015 in legislation that covers all Australian universities and specifies that each program or degree of study requires a set of learning outcomes, as you can see on the screen. They require learning outcomes that are informed by international comparators that cover discipline knowledge as well as the range of skills you can see on the screen in front of you. These are all familiar to anybody who's been involved in these sorts of program level learning outcomes, 21st century skills or graduate learning outcomes as we call them in Australia most commonly. Just keep in mind, these are part of an act of the Australian Parliament and they need to be taken seriously by the Australian universities. To get a sense of how these learning outcomes are working out in Australia, a couple of colleagues of mine uh, did a research project two, uh, three years ago where they asked colleagues at each university, ha ha, these two questions. The questions were, what kinds of assessment are most likely to provide convincing evidence that students have achieved these sorts of learning outcomes? They interviewed 48 people across many universities and several disciplines and they found some common types of assessment that were working well for these learning outcomes. They included reports, but they would be reports of the sort that students would need to produce once they had graduated and were in the workforce. So engineering students, for example, would, would produce an engineering-oriented report. They included uh, critical reviews in traditional disciplines like history or law where students may read a number of articles, books and so on, but they need to adopt a fairly critical stance to what they were reading. Many of the forms of assessment included oral presentations, which is what you're experiencing at the moment. Reports in particular were very often accompanied by students doing an oral presentation. Performances occurred in many disciplines. Uh, in areas like drama, for example, performances are absolutely obligatory, but performances occur whenever a student is actually undertaking the kind of work required by their employment, and that can take many forms. Very often, the assessment was accompanied by a student reflecting on the process of learning and what they had learnt. Many assessments had multiple components. I've already mentioned presentations and uh, reports. Many of these assessments included group work. They shared a number of characteristics. Just remember, these are forms of assessment that are seen to be quite useful for ascertaining whether students have uh, achieved the graduate learning outcomes. They were assessments that encourage students to learn and help them develop their knowledge as well as testing what they knew. Relevance to professional practice I've already mentioned. Uh, students were often put into a professional kind of role. Um, not, they were invited to take a part that they may play in professional practice. For example, if they were studying nursing, they may adopt a, a little teaching role where they have to help a patient learn about a particular aspect of managing a disease. Where group tasks were involved, there was always great care taken in their design. And I think I must accelerate here because we're going to run out of time. So I won't mention each of these. Field placements, I've mentioned at the end, whenever students go into a workplace situation, and this happens quite often, 
the graduate learning outcomes or 21st century skills really come to the fore, as you would expect. 21st century skills are essentially those skills that are required to function well in the workplace. So there's no surprise there. When we've come to look at how, how we do this side of assessment, often it turns out to be not terribly easy. One, one emerging approach to these, uh, assessing these skills is what's known as credentialing. This is largely a function of the growth of online processes. Deakin University have introduced a credentialing process that runs something like this. You can apply to the university to gain a credential in a whole range of 21st century skills. And you can apply if you're already in the workforce or if you are undertaking a program that has a lot of field work involved or if you're doing a postgraduate program. You can apply to gain a credential in an area like uh, communication or critical thinking. You are required to provide evidence of your ability in this area through examples of your work. Um, you are given a lot of information about what's involved in critical thinking and you work your way through uh, an application process. It's moderately complicated, but it's very interesting. Essentially, it means that you are making a claim that you have this, uh, uh, this learning outcome, this ability, and you are providing evidence to support that claim. Ah, sorry. So now, there are a number of things that help us in Australia to move forward. Oh, I haven't mentioned, I haven't mentioned anything about standardised tests. You can ask me about it later if you want to. So over the last 20 years or so in Australia, across the universities, we've developed quite a, a framework for thinking about graduate learning outcomes. We've developed lots of examples of good practice. We've got a large number of faculty who are familiar with the whole notion. Um, we also have a, a system of professional standards in most professions that really overlap graduate learning outcomes or 21st century skills. They are very much alive in the whole assessment um, area in Australia. There are things that slow us down now. Um, we now lack a strong coordinating structure. We do not have the sort of assessment um, organisations that are available in this country. We have no National Centre for Assessment, for example. Um, we have a very autonomous set of universities and faculty within those universities operate fairly autonomously and most assessment occurs at the level of a small unit within a larger program. These are all difficulties that we are needing to overcome. There are many things I haven't mentioned. A question may pop up about some of them. Yes. Yes, please. We think we're dealing with something that's, that's quite complex and quite difficult. We've been working on this for 26 years, and we still are. And at that point, I will stop. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. The Thank, next you speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. ورقاته التي قدمها لنا ننتقل الآن إلى الورقة الثانية مع الدكتور مايكل ماكوميس وهو مدير ورئيس تنفيذي لهيئة اعتماد المدارس والكليات المهنية بالولايات المتحدة الأمريكية حيث انضم لها عام 1994 يشغل منصب المدير التنفيذي للهيئة منذ عام 2008 كذلك يشرف الدكتور على إجراءات الاعتماد للهيئة على الصعيد الدولي كما أنه المسؤول عن الاتصال بمجتمع التعليم العالي لتطوير فعاليات الهيئة ويتمحور عمله 
في هيئة اعتماد المدارس والكليات المهنية حول مخرجات الطلاب بالإضافة إلى تصميم إجراءات الاعتماد المتمحور حول الطالب والدكتور ماكوميس حاصل على درجة البكالوريوس في التاريخ ودرجتي الماجستير والدكتوراه في التربية من جامعة فيرجينيا كما خدم قبل التحاقه بالجامعة في سلاح البحرية الأمريكي ككهربائي متدرب وفني تدفئة وتهوية وتكييف ما أكسبه العديد من المهارات في هذين المجالين والذي سيثري هذه الورقة العلمية والتي ستكون بعنوان المنهجيات المبتكرة في قياس المهارات So please, Dr. Mike Moss. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I have no idea how I was introduced, but I'm sure that it's all true. Um, uh, and I'm uh, very pleased to be here, and, and uh, this is my fourth opportunity to come to the kingdom and, and share some uh, of the best practices that I've been engaging in and accreditation in the United States and, and really um, uh, and, and on a worldwide stage. And so I'm going to talk a little bit uh, just about some of the things that, that, that I'm experiencing and, and, and what we're trying to achieve. Um, and so I've been given 10 minutes, 10 minutes to make an impact. And so I'm going to try and do that if I can uh, figure out first how to, how to make this work. So, um, you know, what they asked me to talk about were innovative approaches and skills assessment. And so uh, what I thought I would start talking about are the non-innovative uh, uh, approaches, and, and that's kind of the standard lecture test grade kind of kind of practice. And even in the in the opening ceremony yesterday, as the three young gentlemen were talking about skills that they needed uh, to be successful, one of them said, "Well, all that the all that the faculty did was lecture at me and tell me, and never gave me an opportunity." And 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 what they were really talking about is, what are uh, what are the ways that students can really develop in more dynamic ways? So it's interesting to me then that as we're at this conference about evaluation that I should lecture to you. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to walk away from the lectern for a minute. Hopefully this microphone works. And I'm going to come down here and I'm going to chat with you all. And I'm going to ask you to engage with me for a minute and talk a little bit about what you think are innovative approaches, or, or not even innovative, just what do you think are good practices with regard to assessment? Anybody just yell it out, projects. Now, English is best for me because I don't speak any Arabic, so any <laughs> uh, projects is one. What's another one? Games, another one. Presentations, another one. Projects. Journals. Peer assessments. Online discussions. Very good. What else? Look, the ladies are really killing it over here. So, gentlemen, what do you have to offer for us? Technology. Okay, in the back. I could not hear you. Uh, assessment. Okay, very good. What else? Critical thinking. So, pop, <laughs> pop quiz, okay, very good. So, uh, now I've already eaten into two minutes of my 10, so I have to go quickly. Uh, but really, uh, what, I, what I'm trying to, to talk about is that assessment is not just about the test at the end. That really the way that we need to think about developing innovative approaches is the whole package. And that includes beginning at the beginning how we design curriculum, how we design programs, how we're going to try and work with students to figure out what is it that we want them to know, more importantly even, how are we going to deliver that? And how are we going to work with faculty members along those particular lines? Now, the minister this morning in the opening session talked about sending faculty to Australia for this dynamic kind of teaching program to teach teachers how to teach more dynamically so that we're not tied to that lectern, so that we can get down and talk with our students and get them engaged and find out what they know and how we want to try to figure out how to 
move beyond that. So teaching and learning tie to an objective that's clear, that they know, the faculty knows, and the student knows what we're trying to learn and what we're trying to teach and what we're trying to do. The goals. And so, if we just say, we want you to learn and be critical thinkers, well, what does that mean? Well, it means questioning, and it means dynamic kind of interaction between peers of students and interaction between the students and faculty members. All of those kinds of things create that kind of dynamic approach that leads to critical thinking skills. It's not the content so much as the activity that brings about critical thinking and problem solving. I have to go fast. I'm, gonna, I'm getting out of breath here, but I'm trying to get as much in this as I can. Okay, competency-based. And, you know, interestingly enough to me, competency-based education is the oldest form of education that there is. Does anybody disagree with that statement? Does anybody know what I mean by the oldest form of education? Old-fashioned? Well, if you didn't know how to make fire, you weren't going to survive. All right, making fire was a competency, and you, taught, you were taught how to do it by practice and action, and then the next generation learned how to do that, and they taught the next generation all through the act of doing and learning. But where competency-based education becomes problematic is when you try to take that model and put it into a big institution with 20,000 students. Now you have this tension between effectiveness and efficiency, right? And so that's why competency-based education challenges us so much. It's not the concept itself, it's the practice of doing it in an, in an efficient kind of way. And I talk a little bit about learning and assessment loops of trying to bring back the ideas of what we're trying to learn and continually through the program talking about those kinds of assessments. And that it, these varied and flexible approaches are what is necessary. That it's not just that linear of lecture, test, grade, but it's a varied approach. Maybe that's one component, but then there's also kind of relational kind of approaches and independent approaches and ascending, things that build on one thing to another. All those kinds of approaches should be integrated into a dynamic kind of curriculum that leads to assessment practices that stick. If I'm at the lectern, I gotta compete with your cell phones, I got to compete with other distractions, but if I'm down here talking with you and sharing the experience with you, then I have a much better opportunity of making an impact. This is where competency-based education gets really hinky, right? Where we have, okay, we say we're going to give this lecture. Let's say that we're teaching a program in automotive technology, okay, technology for fixing cars, and the lecture is going to be on braking, brake technology, what it takes to brake and stop a car. So I give that lecture, and then I send the students out into the lab, and at their pace, they can move into one of these learning pods, domain number one, we'll call that. And when they complete that, well, they can go on to domain number two. It's competency-based, and it's moving, and it's one way to look at how to overcome that issue of efficiency and trying to insert competency-based um, evaluative processes into the program. How am I, how am I doing? I have five minutes left. All right. Good thing I'm halfway through my presentation then. <laughs> All right. So now, so here's, here's the other part of it is that faculty engagement has to be, again, more than just the faculty member talking. And that teaching is as much an art as it is science. That teaching is a calling. Now, I work exclusively with vocational education institutions, right? And so for me, what's really important for faculty members is not only do they know how to be that automotive mechanic, but what else? What else is important for those faculty members? They have to know their skill and be able to teach it, right? Assessment, know how to 
know how to actually teach it. Like, I could be the best that there is in knowing how to do it, but my ability to impart that knowledge to other folks is the key in what makes a teacher a teacher, as opposed to maybe just a faculty member or somebody that just imparts information. If you want to move the kingdom to your 2030 goals, it's about developing more than just the students, but developing the faculty and challenging them in ways that will take these dynamic approaches that you want so badly to incorporate and bring them into the educational environment. Now, I put like tools and methods for me in assessment is really at the bottom of the list. I mean, it's an important part of it, like you gotta know how to do it. Uh, talk about standardized testing and those kinds of things. Yeah, that's one thing. But there are lots of different ways, and much of it is dependent upon the content of the information that you're trying to teach anyway. Like maybe portfolios are really important in what kind of program? Art, exactly. It's really subjective, right? So I want to give you the breadth and examples, not just one sketch that I did, right? Now, and rubrics are really important because I want to be consistent with my peers so that students have an understanding of what the assessment kind of means. I don't know about your experience, but my experience was in school was I had no idea what it took for, to get an A or to get a B or whatever. It's whatever that faculty member thought it should be, right? Not only should the faculty know what those rubrics are, but the students should know too. It should be something that's given to everybody, part of the syllabus. It's part of the program. Here's how we're going to figure out together how well you have done. So I would again be looking at multiple approaches and working with your faculty members to design their program, to design their syllabus in these ways that are dynamic. I have one minute and one slide, so this is going to work out perfectly. So, so for me, as you're designing and looking at ways to put programs together, I encourage you to think about student-centric approaches. Not institutionally centric and not faculty centric, but student-centered approaches. An approach here that puts student success and mastery at the middle of your wheel. Right? So this model here represents a wheel with spokes. And each one of those spokes, those spokes are the things that hold a wheel together. It gives it form and shape. I bicycle a lot, so I, this you know, is familiar to me. And if you get a bent or broken spoke, you know, your wheel starts getting wobbly. It doesn't operate the way that it's supposed to. Each one of those spokes up there are the elements of that program. The objectives and the resources and the design and the content, and how I'm going to deliver that content, and how I'm going to assess it. It's no one thing. Each one of those spokes have to work together, or the whole thing starts to wobble. It gets weak. It doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Again, as a bicyclist, my wheel starts rubbing up against the brake. That's no good, right? So you want to continually look for ways to assess and evaluate how well you're doing those things and asking your faculty to be self-critical and look for ways that they can look to improve themselves to create programs that are the most effective for student success because those are the kinds of things that really get to the issues that you're talking about at this conference. Critical thinking, problem solving, energy, enthusiasm, excitement for learning, and creativity, and so I really encourage you to think about this in a far more dynamic approach. And with that, I'll, I'll end. Shukran, uh, Dr. Michael, ala taqdeemihi li baad al-usus fi bina strategiyat mubtakara fi bina adawat al-taqweem al-maharat. Nantakil الآن للورقة الثالثة لدينا الدكتور جورجيوس سايدريتس وهو أخصائي في علم 
المسح وأستاذ مساعد في طب الأطفال في كلية الطب بجامعة هارفارد يرتبط عمله بالدوافع والإنجازات في المجموعات السكانية النموذجية وغير النمطية كذلك تقويم المهارات والكفايات المعرفية باستخدام المقاربات التحليلية التقليدية والمعاصرة وقد نشر الدكتور أكثر من 120 بحثا في مجلات علمية مثل القياس التربوي والنفسي والمجلة الدولية للاختبارات وغيرها فسيكون ورقته بعنوان تقييم المهارات المعرفية باستخدام نماذج التصنيف التشخيصي So, Dr. Georgios, please. Well, thank you all for coming here. Um, today, I am going to talk about the assessment of skills and competencies using some form of relatively new models from psychometrics. And very briefly, um, I'm not going to go uh, into too much length on the 21st century skills and competencies because you've heard so much during the last few days. Uh, but I want to focus on a, on a couple of key things. Uh, and you've heard what, what these skills are all about. Uh, but what I want to focus on is really the issue of complexity. And the issue of complexity has great implications as to how we assess those skills and competencies using our psychometric tools. So the, um, the current models that we have to assess skills and competencies come from what we call the uh, traditional psychometric approaches or classical test theory or contemporary methods. And you have probably heard of um, uh, the factor analysis model or item response theory. And I want to contrast today for you the use of cognitive diagnostic models as really the only proper means of assessing skills and competencies. And to do that, I'm going to highlight some of the limitations of the traditional ways that we currently have on assessing those skills. Um, so I'm going to describe the two approaches. I am going to present an example and then present some of the limitations and future directions of those models. What you see on the top right, for example, is a classic measurement, measurement model uh, model from traditional psychometrics is the factor model. The boxes indicate questions or items or exercises to assess a skill and a circle has a skill. So the top right model has three skills that are assessed by several exercises or items as we call them. And that's the classic way that we assess skills and competencies. Um, the second, the middle model, is the same using um, a scaled approach, as we call it, using item response methodology. And what I am proposing today is really the third model to the bottom, which is actually the diagnostic classification models. Now, there is a big distinction between the two. First of all, in the bottom model, you see too many arrows. What do those mean? Well, based on the first two models, we usually, when we have exercises or items based on the idea of construct validity and content validity, we write up items that define one and only one attribute. So for example, if I measure self-concept, we have an item that says, I'm good in math. I'm good in dancing or social or whatever. So these items load onto the generalized idea of self-concept. They're not supposed to go someplace else. Well, based on the initial premise, uh, as I started my presentation, that skills are a little more complex, then this idea no longer holds. And I will prove to you that with the traditional ways that we've had to assess skills and competencies, we only collect information. We can't get into a decision or a diagnosis. Um, so the idea is, well, I'm going to get into another example really quickly. So here is, um, we have as a skill reading comprehension. Now, reading comprehension can be divided into several sub-skills. 
so we can have um, understanding the meaning of words, understanding the meaning based on morphology, syntax, and grammatical rules, understanding implicit versus explicit information, understanding negative facts and opinions, critique, and so forth. So these are different sub-skills within the construct of reading comprehension. Well, can we assess those skills using the classical ways, the factor model that we have? Well, yes and no. As you see to the right, I color the items that actually measure more than one skill. That's not within tradition, the way we assess um, uh, skills using the traditional methods. We are supposed to have items that belong to only one category or dimension. So when they belong to more than one, that's a no-no for uh, con uh, classic psychometrics because they cannot define more than one dimension. At least this is how we are uh, taught that things are, unless, of course, we take the model, tweak the models in some ways. So we see several colored items that the same content of the item actually defines many more different skills. So we need to find models that actually can accommodate that. Um, so within the classic factor model, uh, we only collect information. What does that mean? Well, if we have two constructs like addition and subtraction, and we have four exercises that define addition and four exercises that define subtraction, then we get scores. What do these scores mean? Well, if we get factor scores, we know that these scores mean that an individual, for example, is at the 60th percentile and another individual was successful 75% of the time. And we can basically rank order the individuals or we can see the relationships between them. But we cannot tell if actually they have acquired and mastered the skill. So we only get information. We don't get decision-based classification. We don't get discrete-based decisions of the form, I have mastered the skill or I have not mastered the skill. So that's a major limitation. That's a major limitation of those models. Uh, take, for example, those exercises. So the first one says 2 plus 3 minus 1. Well, this one is, of, of course, it's, it's, it's a math um, exercise. And then there is a division and then a multi multiplication. Uh, but what we see is that the 2 plus 3 minus 1 does not assess a single skill. It assesses addition and subtraction. Similarly, the 4 by 2 times 2 plus 3 assesses two skills multiplication and, and um, addition. So we need to accommodate those things. Um, and so this is done by actually assessing those skills and competencies by adding more parameters in our model saying, well, you need to include also the information that comes out from the combination of the two, that we actually call them interactions. And so with a traditional model, we would say that somebody has, was successful in 75% of the items or it was in the 60th percentile. But with the cognitive, with the uh, diagnostic classification models, we get information about proficiency. We get information about who is good in what, who is not good, who has mastered the skill, who has not mastered the skill, who should work on something else, and, and so forth. Uh, so we need the difference between the two approaches. So we need a person-based approach. We need to find a way to identify individuals who have or have not a set of skills and competencies. And we cannot do that with traditional approaches. So we could go to a, a, a classic person-based approach, which is like the latent class models, the mixture models. But these are too exploratory. They won't do the job quite yet. Uh, because they will just make up groups of individuals based on what they see, but not based on what we want them to see, like individuals who do not have any skills. So we need to actually define those, tweak these models a little more. Um, so I did an example for CEFR, and what I wanted to do is I wanted to see if actually there are individuals who are successful at the A1 level in language based on the CEFR framework, or A2, uh, and then based on this analysis, we identified individuals who actually were at the pre-A1 level. So those individuals who actually failed the minimum uh, threshold value of all the items. We couldn't identify this subgroup using uh, information from the classical approaches. 
So to summarize uh, the difference between the two approaches, uh, when you go out and you have to decide on whether you're going to bring an umbrella. So this is the decision, this is the classification, this is what, like, mastery, not mastery. Uh, and what are you going to get? How are you going to decide if you're going to get an umbrella? Well, based on information. What type of information? I'm going to go to the weather forecast, I'm going to see the temperature, I'm going to glance at the sky and see the color of the clouds, whatever information. This information comes from classical psychometric approaches. We collect information. We don't decide based on that information. With cognitive diagnostic models, we make up decisions. Somebody has mastered the skill or has not mastered the skill. Uh, and uh, really, the relationship between the first approach, the classic approach, and the DCM approach that I'm proposing is bad. So the relationship for the A1 skills that I used was 0.487. So 0.5, 0.5 squared, 25%. So the resemblance between the old ways that we've had to assess skills and competencies and the new ways, only 25%. These are very different ways of assessing skills and competencies. Now, to the to the, um, I'm not going to go through the complexities here. I mean, I was going to say, um, is this fun and easy to do? Well, it's fun to do, but it's not that easy to do. So you have to do some programming, um, but it's, it's the way to go. Uh, and um, to add to the complexity, how many different ways do we have to use it? These are all different methodologies to actually go through the same idea. So tons of models. Um, that's, that's not good. But it's, it's a beautiful new venue for research. And for example, I want to point to the work of Wang et al. So this is a few months old work that he said, as a measurement of skill, we should add response time. So like individuals who master something within a specific time framework, that's a skill too. Or we should incorporate response time into our skill assessments test. So there is a lot of new uh, venues and avenues for work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Georges, for his presentation on the development of the development of the development of the development. We will move on to the next slide with Dr. Walid Ibrahim, the director of the development of the development of the development ومنسق تقييم نتائج التعلم في جامعة الإمارات العربية المتحدة ودكتور إبراهيم أيضا مقيم لدى هيئة اعتماد الهندسة الأبت والدكتور وليد حاصل على شهادة البكريوس في الهندسة الكهربائية من جامعة القاهرة في عام 1992 وحاصل على شهادة الدكتوراه في هندسة الكمبيوتر من جامعة كالتون في كندا في عام 2002 وفي عام وفي شهر سبتمبر عام 1400 انضم الى كليه تكنولوجيا المعلومات جامعه الامارات العربيه المتحده حيث عمل او يعمل حاليا استاذا في هندسه الكمبيوتر ومنذ سبتمبر 2013 يقوم الدكتور ابراهيم باداره جميع انشطه تقييم نتائج التعلم في جامعه الامارات العربية وتشمل بعض إنجازاته الرئيسية إنشاء البنية التحتية لتقييم نتائج التعلم في الجامعة ووضع سياسات وإجراءات تقييم نتائج التعلم وتطوير مستودع محفظة المستندات الإلكترونية والمبادئ التوجيهية المرتبطة بهذه المحفظة وأحد الإنجازات الرئيسية للدكتور تصميم وتنفيذ نظام إدارة التقييم على مستوى الجامعة من أجل تبسيط عملية تجميع وحفظ التقارير النهائية لنتائج التقييم ويتمتع الدكتور وليد بخبرة واسعة في الاعتماد المؤسسي والبرنامجي وكان أحد الأعضاء المؤسسين لمشروع المراجعة الدورية لبرنامج جامعة الإمارات العربية المتحدة وقد ساهم بشكل كبير في الاعتماد المؤسسي لجامعة الإمارات من قبل الرابطة الغربية للمدارس والكليات والاعتماد الوطني ل 81 برنامجا من قبل هيئه الامارات للاعتماد الاكاديمي وهو ايضا مستشار ومراجع خارج العديد من برامج العلوم والهندسه ويشاركنا يعني في ورقته المعنونه بقياس 
مهارات الاتصال باعتبارها كفاءة أساسية في جامعة الإمارات العربية المتحدة يتفضل الدكتور وليد Thank you very much في الأول الحب يعني هتبقى بايلينجول شوية عربي مع إنجليش فالأول أحب أشكر المنظمين على المؤتمر على التنظيم الهائل والضيافة وأحب أشكر الحضور جميعا ما شاء الله القاعة مليانة الأوتلاين أتكلم الأول just one slide about UE University overview Then I will talk about the skills uh, for the 21st century is in English uh, proficiency support at UEU. Uh, communication skills. Actually, what I'm going to talk about is what uh, we're doing in the Emirates to integrate the learning, uh, the communication skills in our curriculum and how we assess it. Uh, for quick facts about the Emirates, we have about 15,000 students registered this year. We graduated around 65. Uh, 65,000 graduates. We have uh, seen it from uh, 64 countries, and uh, we have a uh, strategic partnership with 80 countries. Uh, globally, we're ranked uh, 35, and we have, we're ranked number five in, in the Arab world, and we have five star film QS. Uh, we have uh, 80 programs, 50 uh, undergrad, and 30 uh, master programs, and one beach depot. Program we have uh, patents uh, around 115 in uh, 2005. And mainly we have nine colleges, nine research center, one uh, science and innovation park, and uh, 46 student clubs, and uh, we have over 160 labs. Uh, quickly about uh, the center. So we, uh, in uh, 2016, we uh, established the center for learning outcome assessment in uh, UEU. El Hadafi Bibasata. احنا عندنا خبرات في التقييم في التقييم النتائج التعلم وفي الاعتماد الاكاديمي في نفس الوقت احنا عارفين ان في الوطن العربي في خبرات كتير تانية فالهدف بتاعنا ببساطه هو نشر ثقافه ووعي التقييم المخرجات التعلم والاعتماد الاكاديمي في الوطن العربي وتبادل الخبرات فلو في حد اي عنده سؤال اباوت المركز ممكن نتكلم بعد المحاضره ان شاء الله فور ذا فيرست 21st century uh, uh, skills. Uh, one of the, of, uh, the statistics they collected in 2006 uh, by the American Association for College and, uh, College and Universities uh, shows that teamwork skills is uh, number one, 45%, followed by critical thinking and reasoning, 33%, followed by communication skills in 30 uh, and so on. And the same result actually in uh, 2014, uh, you can find that critical thinking now it is number one, 72%, going to uh, teamwork and collaboration and in communication, uh, 55%, ability to, to manage multiple priorities, 48%, and so on. And uh, based on that, actually what we did at uh, UEU, we developed our core competences. The competencies that every uh, doesn't matter how you are in the government, or 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 in the أو or in the the government, or in the أو or in the government, or in the skills. Discipline the knowledge and the طالب لازم يكون يعرف المجال بتاعه طبعا and آخر واحد can research. النهاردة أنا هتكلم بالذات على communication skills how we integrate the communication skills in our curriculum and how we did assess it. Uh, 
Uh, in, uh, in our uh, university, communication skills, we, we start first by a one-year foundation program. So, كل طالب في جامعة الإمارات عشان يبدأ يدرس التخصص بتاعه لازم يعدي a certain level of uh, English proficiency. Uh, في our case, we set it as 5.5 in IELTS. And if they didn't score 5.5 in IELTS, they have to attend for one whole year in foundation program in order to uh, pass this, uh, this level. And after that, we have we help them in English, uh, English skills at two levels as well, uh, in general uh, education courses. So every student in the university have to attend two courses in English, and then we uh, added English also in the major specific courses, and which is called uh, uh, English across the curriculum. Again, I'll talk about it in a second. And then we have to support students also have several centers in the university for writing centers, speaking center, reading centers, tutorial center, independent learning uh, centers as well. So what we have implemented, so at the beginning, they, they have two courses in English, and this one is only English courses, but it is not enough. So what can we do in order to help them with English? We start to do a new program called uh, uh, Content and Language Integrated Learning. And this one is a pilot program at UEU. So the idea is we l make the students learn English while they are learning the topic at the same time. So the approach is where students learn subject and second language at the same time. And this one, it is approach uh, uh, CLIL courses are developed by select general ed education courses and major courses. What happened, we, we get the English instructor and sit with the, actually the teacher or, for, or the instructor for the course. And they design the course together in order to include some English component within the course. The idea is sometimes you can, if you have uh, some short kind of questions inside your course or inside your exam, and then you can see and read it, and the students, they have the idea, but actually, and they get the right uh, answer, but English is very bad. And usually, you don't mark them for that, so you don't deduct any marks for, for, from them in order to increase their English proficiency. So what we did in this program is actually, we give them the English component as well inside the course, and we grade the exams and everything based on the English as well. Five minutes? Five minutes? Wow. Uh, so we have five minutes only, so I can... Uh, uh, so, in order to assess it, so we believe actually in learning outcome assessment in, in the university. Actually, we think learning outcome assessment is the X-ray that we use in order to know if the student actually achieving the competences that we deliver or not. And actually, we give it to them in order to know for us as a faculty, we sit together and see where the student are actually achieving or not achieving our learning outcomes. I'm not gonna talk about this one for sure. And uh, this one is about the importance of learning outcomes. So what we did in, in the universities, we have this kind of uh, hierarchy. At the bottom, we have the course learning outcomes, and then we have the program learning outcomes, and then the institutional learning outcomes. Institutional learning outcomes, they have the English competency as one, one of them, and each program must have a learning outcome for communication skills and for the courses as well. And you can see here some of the examples of the uh, program learning outcomes for uh, accounting, uh, communicate effectively in writing and uh, select and use information technology uh, where appropriate. And you can see for each program, they must have a learning outcome associated with communication skills. And as the course level, we do the same thing. So ask uh, faculty to have a communication skills learning outcome in some of the courses, not all of them, of course, but some of the courses when there is opportunity for the student to have learning uh, communication skills, we ask them to add uh, one of the learning outcomes in, in, in the course as well. Uh, we actually assess students for during the uh, during their study for formative uh, kind of assessment, but for our summative assessment, we do it in two main courses. One is a capstone or graduation project, and second one is internship courses. And for these two courses, students have the, uh, to submit written reports and uh, conduct error presentation, and we use specific rubrics in order to assess, uh, assess them with that. But actually, we provide faculty as well with training about how to assess students. So we have a half day of uh, workshops for faculty in order to tell them how to assess students for communication skills. I should time. 
I will move this one because we don't have the time. And here is the report that we generate at the end about the communication skills. This one, it is our uh, uh, communication effective, uh, communicate effectively uh, both orally and in writing to diverse uh, uh, audience. This one, it is our institutional learning, learning outcomes. And if you can see the graph over there, it is the different measurement we get from different programs. And if you see the data here, our first me measurement is coming from the College of Business and from the Bachelor of Accounting. And for each course, we can see what is the score for a student in every course. I think that's it. Uh, success is a journey and not a destination. We are just improving student step by step in order to achieve their uh, competencies. And thank you very much. Dr. Walid, for the نشكر الجميع المتحدثين على ما قدموه لنا وانتقل إن شاء الله تعالى الآن إلى الأسئلة والتعليقات من الحضور سيكون لدينا يعني خمس دقائق للحصول على الأسئلة من لديكم ومن ثم سنفتح المجال للمتحدثين لجابة على الأسئلة. So please we are going to to have five minutes getting questions from the audience then we will answer them collectively. تفضلوا. Yes, question here. Um, I think I have questions for everyone. Uh, Mr. Uh, Walid, uh, um, when you said the discipline uh, assessment, what is that, what the, what, in, your, in your framework, uh, what exactly does that mean? And uh, with Dr. Georgios, uh, with amazing uh, uh, presentation. Now, when you said um, the dimensions within testing, um, it is very important and we need to define the dimensions. Um, uh, but do you think that if we go to the hardest, say, uh, uh, form of knowledge, does it give you an indication of the easiest part? Say, for example, the example that you just you said about language. For example, a word recognizing that I, I heard this word before is the deepest is the the slice the easiest one, and the deepest is knowing uh, the context or the right context in its language, etc. So when I know the deepest or the hardest one, does it give me an indication? So um, for me, if I want to design an easy and uh, quick assessment tool, do I just depend on the and to the heart and just have an indication. Uh, also, the math example was also good. When, you, when, you, when I assess uh, my child about his division, um, only having smaller, uh, fewer items to assess his division, obviously I'm actually assessing his multiple as well in addition. Does this, does this uh, am I right in that? And uh, for you, Michael and, uh, and Jordan, could you um, disc uh, elaborate on standardized tests where skills we don't have actual standardized tests in, for example, majors and disciplines. Uh, for in, in English, we have IELTS and everything. We, in accounting, we have those um, uh, academies where we can assess uh, uh, outcomes. But there are other majors where we don't have standardized tests. Shukran Jazeera. Ntaqil a sual akhar. Warju min al min al sal an yadkar isma wa kadalik uhadid sual liman yujja. Good afternoon. Thank you all for your great, great presentation. Uh, I'm uh, getting my question directly to Dr. Mike. Uh, Dr. Mike, today morning we hear that the only unchanging fact nowadays is changing. Changing is the some, something that we have to believe in, especially in the future. You have presented a great uh, model and framework for assessment and program assessment and delivery which is already also consistent with what AACSB accreditation offers. The only prob problem here that we face now, especially with the accreditation for business school as I have background of business schools, that we cannot expect the needed skills in the future. Now we can do benchmark, we can do surveys, we can ask employers, companies, everybody there around us. But all of them, they are talking about their current status. You know, if we want to design a program, we need almost five years to reassess and redesign that program after having closing some loops 
of that assessment. So how can we design programs that can really be innovative to reflect the skills that we need in the future, especially when we consider business programs that include innovation, entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, and uh, MIS, especially with the blockchain, uh, blockchain technologies and other technologies. Thank you. Well, thank you for that question. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I don't know that I have an answer that I can give you in 30 seconds or less, but having said that, you know, in working in accreditation, which is the field that I work in, what I try to, to talk with our institutions about that are trying to be more dynamic and that, that are trying to be forward reflective is to really incorporate organically the institutional assessment and improvement model into their institutions such that it's not just something that's done periodically or for an accreditation review, but it's something that becomes endemic to the, to the, to the institution. It's part of their fiber. It's part of how they operate. And so continually, you, you can't just rely upon the surveys, like you've said. You, you, don't, you won't get enough information, and it won't be relevant, and it won't be timely. But if you look at multiple touch points and try to gather that information from the business community, from graduates, from uh, forward projections in terms of um, uh, where the jobs are going to be, uh, and looking at current trends and, and trying to project those out, I, all I can really say is it can't be episodic. It has to be something that is continually ongoing within the institution and kind of part of the culture and the soul of that institution. Thank you. Hello. Um, first of all, my name is back here. My name is uh, Dr. Connie Mitchell. I um, work at Prince Sultan University, and my question—I mean, I think any of you could could uh, address it. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for your presentations today, and. I, I really appreciate what you are sharing because it, it's along with my own philosophy of what teaching and learning is about and how we can help facilitate the, the learning of our students. But my advice to you is, and as uh, I believe Professor Mike, you were just saying, it's about the culture within the organization. What would be your best piece of advice about how to develop this kind of organizational culture uh, for all stakeholders, especially if you're starting from scratch. Thank you. 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 Thank teachers in, uh, in educational institutions on the basis of, of assessment innovation. In Australian universities and most Western universities, promotion and success is dominated by research output and that is what leads to promotion and additional pay and so on. I think the most important thing, and if this doesn't happen, it's very, very difficult to improve assessment, is to provide very concrete reward for innovation in assessment. And that includes making sure that innovation in assessment is included in promotion applications and, and uh, similar organizational processes. So what I would add to that is, you, you know, one of the things that, that is most ironic to me is that one of the greatest tensions in many of the higher education institutions that I work with in the United States is this tension between administration and faculty. Uh, and that they're not necessarily seeing each other as working on the same team towards the same goals. And so to your question about how do you get everybody kind of working together, I think you go to what, what was talked about in the presentation is focus on the mission and if the mission is the students, get kind of everybody in the room together and talk about how are we all working towards this mission and culturally how are we going to accomplish that mission and let people see that they're really all working towards the same goal, they just have a different role to play in achieving that. Uh, excuse me, can, you, uh, can we answer the question for our, our colleague in the front? Do not forget. I'm gonna leave the standardized question, uh, t testing thing to George. Okay. Gordon, I'm sorry, Gordon. Please, George. Look, I, 
I have heard what you said about standardised testing. Can you just rephrase the question, please? Oh, we don't have standardised tests in a lot of these skills areas. Well, no, we don't. Um, and in Australia, I think we are not seriously working towards standardised tests because the skills we're talking about are too complex, they are too embedded in, in uh, varying contexts, uh, and it is simply not possible to, to measure them by any sort of test full stop. Almost all of them require some fairly active uh, performance that's observable. Uh, testing some standardised tests may be, may be able to play some small role in the assessment of these abilities, but we think it is very small. And in fact, the efforts to develop more complex standardised tests uh, have been falling down recently, uh, most notably in the AHELO, A-H-E-L-O, um, efforts to develop comparable assessment processes across across universities, across countries. It proved to be too difficult. The closest I think we've got are aspects of the collegial learning assessment that's been developed in the States. So in the Australian context, although some people, particularly psychometricians, believe we should be trying to move towards standardised testing, um, the American saying was leave no psychometrician, no, no child untested. Uh, <laughs> In Australia, we are not pursuing that line because we don't think it is possible or desirable, and it's likely to, uh, it's likely to, if we were possible, it's likely to induce the wrong sorts of learning. So, thank you for the question. Excuse me. So, thank you. These these were great questions. Um, to the question on whether. Uh, when we assess a skill, there are some prerequisite skills, items, words, for example, that we are not sure if the individuals have mastered them. Actually, the DCA models, the diagnostic classification models, are perfect for that purpose because basically you can define a skill with all these prerequisite type of knowledge. So you can incorporate all that uh, information. Now, the second part of your question was, well, is if the assessment is getting too large, I mean, what you know, what do we do? Well, currently with standardized tests, you know, we have like uh, starting rules and ceiling rules. So, for example, if you are eight years old, you are not going to be given uh, letter words, you know, uh, or syllables. You're going to be giving more advanced material. So, unfortunately, we assume that the uh, unfortunately we assume that the prior knowledge without administering the items is actually there, and we don't know that, we just assume it. Now, there are at least two individuals who are pioneers on the third and most novel method, which is computerized adaptive testing, that are just sitting behind you, Dr. Dimitrov and Dr. Han, who have actually developed both methodologies and software to actually implement a very short fragment of items to assess the skills with 99% accuracy. So there is at least three ways. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you for your presentation. My question is for Dr. Mike. I want to ask you about that, what you have mentioned before about uh, the non-innovative approaches to assess is too great. Although we are innovative, we use the innovative assessment of the skills throughout the year, but at the end of the semester or at the end of the year, we are used grade. Is that, and from your opinion, is that correct, depending on the content of the curriculum? Is that correct? Uh, how can, I, can we overcome this problem? Thank you. Well, I, I didn't mean to suggest, and, and I think the other presenters would agree, with, there's nothing wrong with grading per se, uh, as long as the rubrics that are associated with that are well understood and are consistently and, and I think readily applied. And I think that the, that the examples that were given in some of the other presentations about moving away from, say, for example, just the language that goes around grading 
instead of a 70%, it's that the student demonstrates proficiency or that um, you know, uh, the student could improve in this particular area. So it really kind of depends. It's, again, uh, grading is one approach and there's nothing wrong with that, but there are lots of other more dynamic additional kinds of approaches that, that can go into that. And so I, I wouldn't say that at the end giving a grade is, is the wrong approach or non-innovative. I would just simply suggest that the way in which you get to that, um, that you look for ways to be dynamic in the application of it. Uh, can I ask you? Hello? Can you... Can, uh, Elaborate a little bit what you mean by grading. So are you talking about the final grade for the course or what? So actually when you assess an outcome, you don't go with the final grade for the course. You should have specific questions that you design as Dr. Mike was saying, specific questions inside your assessment, inside your uh, quizzes, inside your assignment, inside your final exam itself that target specific outcomes. So you don't use the whole grade at the end as a way to assess you have to design your questions and then you measure the achievement based on that. Thank you. Thank you for your gentlemen for the diverse uh, perspectives that we have today. Uh, my question goes to Dr. Uh, Jordan. Um, I would like to know your opinion and the best practices that you have in Australia uh, when it comes to situation that we are, I, we are facing in building programs in higher education. You mentioned that in, in Australia you have the learning attributes for all university graduates. So when you, you are trying to assess um, the, the graduates, you have to uh, be aligned with the professional standards for certain majors, and you have to be aligned with the university general attributes, and then you have to be aligned also with other maybe other qualifications. So that is that is too much to assess, and uh, before that, it's too much to address during the instructions and the uh, the the whole program. So what what are you doing uh, in in this situation? What is the how, how do you deal with this dilemma? Thank you. Okay, I, I'm having some trouble hearing. I think I heard a, th a third of the question, and I think I can reply to the whole of the question. Um, how do you deal with uh, these different sorts of standards? For example, we have the graduate learning outcome statements that are now embedded in legislation. One way that they're dealt with um, is, is often through using a sort of checklist where the assessment tasks across a whole program are lined up against those graduate learning outcomes and boxes get ticked. And some people believe that sort of process and some people think, no, I don't, I don't believe that's really telling us the truth about the situation. We certainly have the issue of sort of conflicting, conflicting learning outcome sets one is the graduate learning outcomes for each university uh, and the, the graduate learning outcomes that I mentioned were specified now in an act of parliament. Another powerful set of learning outcomes is in the professional standard statements of the professions. So if you're teaching, uh, for example, in a social work program, you are having those two sets to deal with. That is the professional standards of the social work profession which are all codified, and the graduate learning outcomes specified by the Australian government, and they are then filtered through the, your own university. Now, it is not possible, it is simply not possible cognitively to deal with two sets of learning outcomes when you're designing a program or assessment. It's absolutely critical that a program retains its professional accreditation, and what usually happens in practice is that the teachers uh, and faculty designing and running programs and planning assessment do so on the basis of the professional standards statements rather than the graduate learning outcomes. There is so much overlap. Um, the trick that is usually employed is to design a table, uh, a matrix that allows you to equate professional standards with the graduate learning outcomes and hope that that will keep you out of trouble. 
but it is quite difficult. The notion of learning, graduate learning outcomes, the very notion of learning outcomes often runs counter to how many of us think about the whole process of learning and teaching. So it's, it's so difficult to get your head around graduate learning outcomes at a university level and the requirements of your own profession and your own personal ways of thinking about teaching and learning. Thank you. باسمكم بهذا الجمع الغفير وباسم اللجنة المنظمة للمؤتمر نتقدم بالشكر لجميع المتحدثين لدينا وسنقدم لهم تكريم بسيط. So thank you a lot. We will we have some small recognition for you. نتقدم الآن لممثل اللجنة العلمية بتكريم المتحدثين ورئيس اللجنة دكتور جوردن. Dr. Michael. Dr. Georgios. Dr. Walid Ibrahim. Dr. Rashid Saif Al-Mahrizi.